piece might sound a little familiar to us, but not quite familiar enough. Yes, you might have guessed it's by a composer whose last name is Bach, but it happens not to be the last name of Johann Sebastian Bach, but of Johann Christoph Friedrich Bach, who is one of Bach's many sons. He got involved in the music business, or at least five Bach sons who left their mark in the composition world, uh, several of whom played really important roles in the transition from Baroque-style music to early classical style of music, and that includes uh, this fellow here. By the way, this piece is not called a prelude, it's called a solfeggio, a kind of practice piece, but clearly it's an homage to the prelude that we talked about before, the prelude in C major. Now, one thing that we might notice straight away is that this solfeggio is politely in a different key. He's not doing a direct copy, we've moved it up here. There's something else that we might notice straight away, and that is where Bach had the courage of his convictions with respect to his chord progression, he would play each chord twice as though the, uh, the prelude was providing its own echo throughout the entire piece. We'd hear each of these chords twice. In the solfeggio, we only hear each chord once. Also, a very important step harmonically seems to have been left out. If I were to to play the solfeggio using the same harmonic sequence that Bach used. I would have played something like this. And instead what we get is... So where the original Bach prelude went from tonic harmony to 2-4-2 two, two, to 5-6-5 five, five, to 1, what the solfeggio does is go directly from the tonic chord to the 5-6-5 five, five, and back to the 1 again. And that seems to have been the main idea of the piece because what happens after that is a whole series of what sound like quasi 5-6-5 five, five to 1 progressions. I'll play them for you. Here's the, the main one that we start out with. Now we hear something similar but it's resolving to a different harmony. Again, something similar but resolving to a different harmony. And again, and again, and again, but that takes us back to where we started. So what's happening here is a kind of musical copy and paste. What's being pasted around is the use of a dominant seventh sonority, but that's not just being applied in the home key. It's being moved around to different chords of the main key but it's treating each of those chords as though they are the tonic chord of their own key. When we do that, what we're talking about are things called secondary dominance or secondary dominant function chords. For example, what we hear at the start is tonic 5-6-5 five, five to 1. That 5-6-5 five, five is a primary dominant. It's a dominant in the home key, in the tonic key. What we're hearing here is definitely another dominant seventh sonority, a major minor seven. But clearly I can hear by that triad that this is not a major key, this is something minor. And then I hear another one. Now this one sounds major, but it's not our, our tonic harmony. So all of those other things that sound like dominance but aren't actual dominance in the home key, we call secondary dominance. So what we want to do in this particular video lecture is consider what's taking place, how that works. And the reason why we're interested in this is twofold. Looking back, I had some questions when I was introducing the supertonic seventh. Uh, I was describing it as, as though it were a dominant seventh of the key of the dominant before uh, that would result to one in the home key. So you might remember at the very start of that video what we did is we wrote some resolutions of 5-7 to 1 chord in the key of G major that did something like that. And afterwards what we did is we removed the, uh, the literal dominant 7 and we turned it into a minor 7, the 2-7 chord. So that's where I first introduced this idea of a dominant of a dominant, a secondary dominant. Uh, in that particular case, but I didn't talk about it more at that point because I didn't want to overwhelm you. What I want to do today is actually focus on the idea of the secondary dominant itself, and that 
is not just looking back, but it's also going to be looking forward. This is going to be very helpful for the next area that we go into because I'm going to apply it to this Joplin piece that we were listening to before. And it's also going to help set us up for circle of fifths progressions later on in the course. So the first thing that I'm going to do once again is to move the camera and we'll take a look at the board where I've sketched out the uh, solfeggio. So once more, just so you get a sense how it sounds in your ear. So what I've done on the board behind me is write out the actual entire solfeggio that we were listening to uh, in a somewhat simplified form, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. I've tried to set up the camera so that you can see the whole thing. I haven't put in any bar lines because I wanted to create enough space as I needed to be able to get the entire chord progression down here and within the camera frame. Also, you'll see me using uh, both a combination of the key signature and accidentals. Because I'm not using measure lines of any kind, uh, the accidentals only apply to the particular note heads that they're working with. Otherwise, the key signature, the key signature for D major controls the whole sequence. Also, one thing that I've done, and I don't know how clearly this will show up in the video, but I've used a two color scheme where diatonic chords, that's to say, chords that are actually built upon diatonic scale degrees as their roots, those are all written with black and other funny kinds of things. I've used a slightly uh, bluish color. So the first thing I want to do for you is point out the melodic line that we are working with. I'll just play that for you by itself. quite a simplified melody and what I want to point out as well is that I can also have a little bit of melodic line in the bass that would go with it. a lovely bit of counterpoint once again between the soprano part and the bass part. You'll note that the texture is switching back and forth between five parts and four parts. Uh, what you'll especially notice is one place in the piece which is where it kind of speeds up quite a bit. One of the reasons why it's doing that is because rather than doing the sort of repetitions that we heard before, I mean which we're mimicking this idea, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That repetition that was taking place here. Obviously, we have that being imitated, but later on, uh, the solfeggio tightens up the harmonic progression to build a bit of excitement. So that's why some other parts have dropped out. If you look more closely at the five-part texture, uh, a lot of it is driven by the sort of style of keyboard playing that the composer has in mind. The uh, doublings and things like that aren't quite as judiciously chosen as we get in the Bach prelude in C major. Uh, maybe Bach's son thought his father was a bit too much of a fuss budget. But in any event, this is the chord progression that we're working with. To break it down, what I want you to notice is that I have thus far filled in only some of the harmonies uh, that go with the melodic pitches. And so, for those harmonies, I've actually provided the Roman numeral analysis underneath. And so you can see how I start out with this 1565 idea. And then I have a 6 chord, then a 
four chord, five chord, six chord, five, six, five, one, four, two, five, six, five, one, two, six, five. That's a very familiar progression for us. That should be a five, seven, my apologies. And one, I'll put that five, seven in there right now. So it seems like we have some target harmonies to work with. Occasionally we get chord progressions that come straight out of our own textbook where we can see a whole bunch of Roman numerals in direct succession with each other, but there are these gaps in other places. Now you remember when I was first introducing this piece and playing it for you, one of the things I was saying that was that there's a kind of copy and paste idea here that uh, the composer uh, Johann Christoph Friedrich Bach seemed to want to get straight to the 565 to 1 idea rather than waste time messing around putting in a 242 chord before I got there. He went straight for the money right there. And that idea is something that he seems to be playing with in all of these other spots that I've given in blue and where I haven't provided Roman numeral analysis. So, what I'll show you is what's happening. If I see these kinds of target points in the original score that it's sort of like I'm going from a one chord to a six chord to a four chord with you know passing tone upper neighbor passing tone you can imagine this uh, harmonization slowly building up from non chord tones and then the non chord tones themselves being harmonized uh, if I were to actually play that for you. And of course it's repeated again here. What it sounds like is a 5-6-5 five, five of 6, as though I were in the key of B minor being used. So what I can do is write it in that fashion, and in that way I can say, look, this is a secondary dominant. It's a dominant, but not in the key of the tonic, not in the home key. It's a dominant of some subsidiary chord within that key, chord six, the submediant, and in this case, a, a B minor chord. Another way in which I could write that, if I wanted everything to be a little bit neater, it wouldn't show that secondary dominant idea quite as clearly. All of this as though it were in the key of six, okay? Secondary dominant there. Likewise, here I've got, I think that's the point where he switches around from a five part to a four part. Let me see if I remember. <laughs> So at that point, I still need this. And what I have here would again be like a 5-6-5 five, five of G major, of the key of 4. Likewise here, and here we are working just in the, the 4 parts, it's as though I'm going into the key of a major, so I have a 5-6-5 five, five of 5 there. Back to this 5-6-5 five, five of 6 that I had before. And then finally I'm back where I started out again. Okay, So it started out with this idea, then hopped down uh, what we could call an underlying root progression by third. It's another reason why I'm giving you this piece right now. It's going to be setting up an important new root progression that we'll be talking about in uh, either the next video or the video straight after that. Uh, so from one through to six through to four and then climbing back up again. So what I get now is this opening harmonic idea being iterated over and over again that Five six five to one. Five six five to one. Five six five to one of that key. Five six five to one of that key. Five six five to one of that key. A series of what we can call 
tonicizations. Uh, apologies for the term. It's one of those unfortunate nouns that get produced by academic studies in general. It means tonicizing, no, treating it, or a core, treating it as though it were a tonic harmony, even if that isn't literally the case. And that's something that we'll be able to expand upon in the next example. But what I want us to notice at that point is that uh, the solfeggio is not yet finished with that. We have the opportunity once again to offer a tonicization of chord four, the subdominant G major right there. We come down to a new one that we haven't tonicized before, which is chord two, supertonic. So note how the solfeggio is doing that subdominant function thing where it shifts from a four chord to a two chord. It's kind of extending the idea of subdominant function, which is a great thing to do before you're getting ready to set up for a final cadence. Now we're back to our primary dominant, five, six, five to one. Our good old friend, two, six, five, going to finally a big five, seven to one in root position. So notice that with all of these seeming dominant sevenths, whether they're actually a primary dominant seventh or a secondary dominant seventh, none of them is in root position until finally we get to this special one here, which has at last been preceded not by a secondary dominant, but just a humble two, six, five in the home key. So it's kind of like the composer is draining out all of this uh, possibility for key confusion out of our ears we're getting something that sounds like a fully fledged two, six, five chord going to five, seven to one. At the very end, I'm putting these things in square brackets because we have a pedal point. And so what you can hear is uh, tonic harmony. And then you can see where I still haven't filled in one harmony, but I've just put in a, a C natural at that point. What's happening is this thing is being held onto as though it were five, seven, of four, sort of a last gasp, a uh, secondary dominant right there. And then four chord, finally proper five, seven. So at the uh, very end, I'll take it from here to the end. sounds like tonic harmony, but now we switch over to taking that tonic chord, putting a seventh on it. Not a major seventh, but a minor seventh. So it sounds like a five seven in G major. What I'm doing there is actually hopping up a third. That's what the solfeggio does. It's turning it into a dominant ninth. There's the four chord. tone underneath the implication of 5-7 underneath it, and then the resolution. So once again, if you want to follow along at home, going to do next is take this very classical music sounding structure and see how there's some ideas in there that could be applied to ragtime. Once again, we're going to go back to Scott Joplin briefly, and also whether that can help us look ahead to some of these chord types that we haven't yet explored in this course. In particular, chord six, submediant, 
and also to go with that mediant harmony. Mediant in particular is something that, that's chord three that hasn't been explored here, but actually it's a big deal in that Scott Joplin rag solace, and in fact that is something that also has a secondary dominant associated with it by Joplin. So just a quick reminder of what that piece sounded like. again, Scott Joplin is making use of a kind of chord progression that we love to talk about in music theory. It is a secondary dominant, and he's also doing it in a very particular way that helps introduce us to some new ideas that will be the subject of the next video. But right now I'm just going to switch the camera angle and I'll show you uh, another harmonic reduction of that piece on the board. Okay, we're back. And what I've done is come up with a harmonic reduction of Joplin's solace that I've written out in this fashion. I'll just play that particular chord progression by itself and then I'll put it back into its original form. The first thing I'll point out is that Joplin does a, a register shift at the beginning. He starts in a low register and then pops it up the octave. And so I've just taken it at the octave because that's where most of the harmonic uh, progression takes place. So just so we hear what that's like, it starts out down here. up to here, okay? So here we are, chord one, six, two, six, five. Suspension going to five, seven. And we have that lovely tonic seventh chord, a major seventh chord. And then play it in the original form. All right, so that is as much as I've given to you. A couple of things I want us to notice to start out with, something interesting is happening here. If we look at the bass line, it's as though there is some kind of root progression that's new for us. Up to this point in the course, officially, we've only been working within two types of chord progressions, root progression by fifth and root progression by second. In fact, there's only one new type of root progression that we're going to learn about, that's root progression by third. And so literally, you can see that being the case here, as I move from tonic harmony through submediant harmony, those are root progression by third apart from one another. And something that goes along with that is a lot of common tones, as we'll see in the, the next couple of videos. I have quite a lot of common tone motion available to me, which sometimes can make these harmonies blend in with each other. But there is a significant change, and that is if I go from tonic harmony to submediant, it's kind of like going the opposite direction of 1-6, where you're extending a harmony by putting it in first inversion, but that, that would still be preserving the same sound quality of the original triad. If I go from a major quality triad in root position to one that's in first inversion, it's still sounding fundamentally the same. But if I go in the opposite direction and actually create a chord based on what's available in the root. I get chord six. So I'm going from something that sounds major in quality to something that sounds minor in quality. And then I extend that to something that ordinarily would be 
a four chord. If it were a four chord, then that would also be root progression by third. However, this is in fact root progression by fifth because chord two is root progression by fifth from chord six. But it's again, like that chord of the added six, it's as though it wants to pretend it's subdominant harmony. And we approach chord five and resolve everything. So this is a very normal harmonic pattern where in a sense, I have chord six acting as a kind of extension of tonic harmony. So that's tonic function. I have my subdominant function there, my dominant function there, back to tonic function. All of this makes perfectly good sense to us. And if we start the process out again, the, uh, the melodic line uh, that we would be familiar with starts right here. This is kind of a transition chord. This time we start making that move from one to six, but in this case, rather than going straight down to six, we're moving to submediate harmony in an inversion. Almost starts to sound like Beethoven in a way. What's happening here? I seem to have taken this idea of briefly passing through a minor mode quality chord and now I'm making a big deal of it. And what I have done is put all of this chord progression within the context of chord three. Now, if I'm in the key of F major, which is what I am in, chord three is a minor triad, A, C, E. And in that sense, it sounds very different from tonic harmony. It sounds like we're going into a different world. So this is an example of a tonicization. This one isn't just using a secondary dominant though. We're actually having something like a cadential 6-4 being given to us in the key of the median. So it's kind of like we're really expanding on the use of chord three and turning it into a, a big harmonic moment. And so this piece, in that sense, it's almost like it's juxtaposing a nice major quality chord one with a minor quality chord three. And that idea of going from the major quality to something minor is something that was actually set up right from the very beginning of the piece. It's gestured at again here and taken up there. Now, it's not fully convincing that I've gone actually into the key of A minor. So that's why I'm keeping this all understood within the context of mediate harmony chord three. If this were really gonna sound like I'd gone into the key of A minor, I would expect to hear something more like this. But I'm not getting that. I have the fifth of this chord that's being heard in the melody rather than that scale degree three, scale degree two, scale degree one type of melodic shape that usually is used to cap a cadential six, four to five to one progression. So Joplin is being very careful here to not give too much weight to chord three, but it's like a kind of shadow has passed over the piece harmonically. And what is making that possible is this thing right here. I guess I should circle it in blue. Our friend, the secondary dominant, is what is making that possible, okay? So we've seen a, another application for the secondary dominant here. And I should, of course, just briefly mention that um, when I first introduced this concept at the start of the video, uh, hopefully, if I remember correctly, I talked about the secondary dominant, secondary dominant seventh. Uh, there is this idea of a dominant function chord too, though. And you might remember in the uh, Schumann piece that we studied before, it's not part of this video series, at least not yet, but we'll, we'll get there. The, uh, from Foreign Lands and Peoples, right? That harmony. We're in the key of G major. That is a diminished seventh chord which we understand in the key of the dominant, D major. And suddenly I hear that wonderful move as though I'm going into another key. Which makes possible all sorts 
sorts of interesting contrapuntal relationships between the parts. So I can actually have the idea not just of a secondary dominant or a secondary dominant seventh, but the idea of a secondary dominant function chord, and that's what we had in that Schumann piece. In any event, what I want to do next, not in this video, but in the next one, is start to talk about these very interesting chords. Chord six, chord three, the submediate and the mediate. How do we make good use of them? Clearly, Joplin knows exactly what he's up to. There's a marvelous piece. Uh, we want to see if there's something that we can come to understand about conventional uses of those chords that Joplin is in fact exploiting here. So when we come to our next video, what we'll be starting out with is two harmonizations of the same melody, but done by different composers in different ways. And specifically what we're going to look for are ways in which the same melodic line can be harmonized one way with chord types that are more familiar to us. And the second time around, we're going to see if we can find use for things like substitutions of six and three and also chord two, as it'll turn out. So that'll be the topic for the next video, but I hope you found this helpful today.